Hey, what's up, what's up? So today I'm going to be talking about two things. I'm going to be talking about the Nairobi Film Festival. Ten days just ended a few days ago, like two days ago. And as a, as a part of the closing ceremony, they played Our Land, Our Freedom, a documentary that came out back in 2023. Has been doing all this international film festival circuit and now it's back in the country. So for the first time, it was screened during the festival and I had an opportunity to actually see it. So I'm going to actually review that first and then I'm going to be talking, I'm going to give my opinion on Nairobi Film Festival as a whole at the end. So let's start with Our Land, Our Freedom. So, Our Land, Our Freedom. If, if I was to give this out of 5, I would give this a 4.5 out of 5. It's a really, really good documentary. It's one of those documentaries that reminds you of just how dark the colonial periods were. So this follows uh, Wanjugu Kimati and Mukami Kimati. Mukami Kimati is the wife of Dedian Kimati, a freedom fighter in Kenya. And so this is years later after independence, after the white people went, but still you find that a lot of people, a lot of freedom fighters, a lot of people who were involved during that particular period still never got to get back their land. So you find a lot of landless people who are involved in the fight for freedom in Kenya, but they still don't have what their parents had. You know, they still don't have what is rightfully theirs, in quotes, because I, you, you, you all can't be sure what belonged to who. But, the, you know, but the most obvious thing is that before the white people, these people were there, they owned the land. And then when white people came, they displaced them, they took the land, tried to do whatever they did with them, and then the white people left. And then the same people were just left they, they were just squatters in general and, and that's one of the best thing about this documentary because it does a good job of showing you these people these forgotten people you know i was looking at most of the people who are depicted in the in the documentary and you could tell that back in the freedom fighting days these were young people you know imagine you as a young person your life is suddenly disrupted by these foreigners who come and suddenly chase you away from your home and so the documentary does a good job of you know, capturing that picture of these people who are still struggling to get their life together, even in their old age. And they do it in such a way that is both heartbreaking and, you know, kind of disturbing. Because I was looking at a few characters who were reliving those days. Some of them were in the bushes and were fighting and were describing some of the kind of tortures that they used to go through. And it's, it's very, very heartbreaking. And it's sad. And there's something that I talked about in my, in, my, in, my, in my article whereby I talked about these people, this documentary should be shown to the European young people, you know, it should be shown to the Buckingham Palace. Uh, ki, ki, our King Charles III should watch this documentary. You know, there's that thing of, as time goes, we forget, we, te we tend to forget, we tend to forget what's actually happened, you know, we tend to forget the atrocity of what happened during what happened in Africa during the colonial period, before the white people, and when the white people came, Belgium in Congo, you, you know what happened in South Africa, the southern part of Africa, what happened in East Africa, what happened in West Africa. Apart from slavery, those colonial periods, we forget that. Yet we tend to talk a lot and we tend to focus a lot, even in history, about Second World War and what happened to a particular group of people and how we are not supposed to discuss some things because it's very sensitive, what happened to them was tragic and stuff. Yet, in our, in our own continent, we have some outrageous atrocities that were done to our people. Yet the people who wrote the history really don't, they gloss over that information. They don't really want to touch on that. And I like the fact that this documentary exists because it's going to remind our kids. This should be played on Mashuja Day, the same way that they play all those uh, archive videos they should play this documentary to just remind people remind young people of what their great grandparents and grandparents actually went through because of white people now the documentary does a good job of capturing that and capturing uh, the concept of land and how land was important how much land means to this particular group of people and how it feels for them to actually have lost it because there's a sense of desperation from these older people you know, they, they, they need that parcel, even if it's a small parcel. There was that sense of a need for that to call your own, you know, a land to call your own. 
Uh, the other thing that I liked is uh, there's a raw feeling, there's an authentic raw feeling to uh, the production in terms of the technicalities, like there's a lot of shaky cams, there's a lot of um, quick cuts, there, there, there are a lot of amateurish uh, shots that you understand because they were taken with the phone during a very tense moment, so you don't really get to see everything, there's a lot of voiceovers. So the, there's that authentic feel from the production, there's that authentic feel from uh, capturing Mukami in her age, interacting with her grandchildren, interacting with her daughter. You know, and she's, she's, a, she's a very inter interesting personality in her old age because she's much more calmer, uh, she's much more introspective. That's what I got from the documentary. And, and, and she, she still has the fight because you could feel when she was making, you know, you know she's old. We see her in a very, un unfortunately she passed away, but we also get to see that in the documentary and you get to hear her speak to people and you can still feel the fight inside of her. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, so generally in terms of the technicalities, uh, the voiceover help, despite the fact that I have a big problem with the voiceovers, they work well in giving us an idea of the state of mind of Wanjugu as she went through this particular, as, as she goes through her fight for these people. Then the other thing that I um, also appreciated was the timestamps, you know, at 20, 2017, then they have a timestamp that gives you an idea of what is happening during that period. So when you jump to a different year, you have a clear idea of this happened during this particular time, this happened during this particular time, and this other thing happened during this particular time. So I thought that was pretty cool. Most documentaries don't do that, so sometimes you might feel lost, you might wonder uh, where are we but but they do a very good job with that i talked about the people so the heart of this documentary is the people yeah i could talk about everything else but the the heart of this yes you have anjugu and the kemati family but it's the people the ordinary people the people the women dancing outside as they wait to go to see a piece of land you know the the cars getting stuck and people pushing it you know the people in the courtrooms the ordinariness of uh, the authentic look and feel of the documentary is the heart and the people. And in my article I talked about showing this in the parliament. You know, we have a parliament. We are free, but we are still slaves. Actually, our leaders are the modern, our leaders are the modern colonial masters, if you actually think about it. Because we have a scene where two leaders pop up and they make a fake promise. Yeah, and it's good that it's documented. You have a leader saying something about it because they know that these people need this. So they actually just throw it out there because it gives them a political advantage. We are years into after whatever that person said, said, and yet nothing has been done. These people are still, anyway, I don't want to go into that. But yeah, it goes to show that this documentary also needs to be screened at the parliament, like repeatedly, like before they start a session, they should be watching that documentary. Because you get to see real people, what they have to go through. Real people are suffering. Yet these people, anyway. Yes, so as I was saying, this is something that all our leaders need, all our modern day colonial masters need to see so that they understand what the real ordinary people are going through. You know, the, the, the desperation. You know, and, and I'm not saying everyone. They, they, you can't imagine your, your father, your grandfather went to war, died, and then they died for nothing because you don't have the land. They were fighting for the land that was taken away from them. But still, you as the, you know, as the descendant of that particular group of people, you don't have the land. You don't have what your parents fought for. And all you have to do is continue paying taxes and things being changed in order to just make your life as hard, as, dif as difficult as possible. Anyway, that's what I thought. So if you see this documentary, um, it's the people it's just how they are able to capture Mukami, and I'm glad that finally there's a documentary out there that captures her, her later years, at least to get to hear her speak, we get to see her smile, we get to see her laugh. I also like the fact that they injected a, a, a certain level of sense of humor within the documentary because it's a very difficult show to watch, so I thought that was pretty cool. So what did I not like? Because I gave this a 4.5, not a 5 out of 5. So this 0.5, the reason I did not put it there because I have a lot of problems with this documentary in that um, while it works for what it is because it understands its theme, its land and its 
freedom fighters. It understands exactly what it is. Yes, you have the normal structure of a documentary where you have a very hard hitting opener and then you jump into the story and then everything escalates from that. But, oh my gosh, I, I don't know how to put this. This documentary, according to me, because I'm looking at it as a visual communication production, from a visual point of view, from a production point of view, I, I thought it, it was extremely generic. It was too formulaic. It, it, it was too safe. It's a very safe documentary. It doesn't try to do things outside what it's supposed to do. It's doing everything perfectly the way it's supposed to be done. That works for it. But now, I'm not saying that you can compare it to Battle of Lycopia. They're two different productions. But to give you an example, Battle of Lycopia, if you were to wake me up and ask me, what do you remember about that? I would just scream pacing because of how some scenes were edited. You know, whereby you slow down a scene, you hold a scene, and you hold a scene and let people just take in what these people are talking about. Because when you talk land, yes, you have people who are talking. Yes, you have exposition. You have all these exciting things that are happening around freedom fighters and the politics of land and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about land. And one of the biggest rules in cinema is show, don't tell. So you need to show a lot of the land. I like the waterfall scene. Beautiful. Fantastic. That, that is the only thing that I can remember going like, wow, that, that is awesome in terms of just visuals because it's a very beautiful shot of um, the forest and then, you know, the waterfall. And I wish they would have done more scenes like that, whereby you just have an aerial shot, whereby you have an aerial shot or a drone shot just showing the land. So that when someone watches this, they understand exactly what it means. Yes, you have a few scenes like that, but I wish there were more of that. There were more quiet moments where you're just shooting a huge space of land and it's a B-roll and it's a very long B-roll that just, I did not see Mount Kenya. Yeah, which is okay. I know it's pretty generic, but just a wide shot of Mount Kenya, a wide shot of a drone shot just showing the land and you get an idea of actually why the white people would actually want to steal this from us, you know? You give people a visual uh, idea of what exactly people are fighting for. I don't know if I'm making sense. The other thing was, again, the technicalities. Like, there are moments that you go like, ah, man, stop playing that music. Because that music is like, oh, we have a very intense emotional moment. But then the violins come out and you're like, no, you don't need the violins. This can work very well as a silent scene. This can work perfectly without the noise. Just, just keep the music away. Let people talk and just embrace silence. Silence is so powerful in documentaries. Or silent is, if you want to trigger people's emotions, let a person speak, do not play the music. Just let go of the music and let that person speak. It has more power than actually, and I'm not a fan of, I, I, back to the Battle of Lycopia, the, the one that I thought it was so effective was with the silent moments. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pro that, I'm sorry, I'm just pro that and I think it's far more effective when you embrace silence. Um, the other thing is that I thought it was an information for the Dian Kemati uh, Freedom Fighters Foundation. There's nothing wrong with that. But there are moments where the documentary stops to tell you about what the Dian Kemati Foundation does. And I'm, I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, but I just felt that it was kind of heavy-handed in telling you, oh, this is the office, uh, this is where she sits, this is what uh, happens. You know, you feel like it's, it's so structured in a way that it feels like a YouTube information. You know the way you watch a YouTube video and then somewhere in the middle someone pops up and says, by the way, do you know I've been eating ABCD? I've been eating ABCD because of ABCD. So it, that's how it felt. But I think it works within the story. It works well within the story. For me, I could actually see it. The other thing is Wanjugu, man. Yeah, Wanjugu, I, I, when the documentary is very good and we follow her, I thought there were lost opportunity to actually connect with her. Let me explain. You have a lot of voiceovers. You have a, a lot of voiceovers in the beginning, whereby you can see her speak and then there is the B-roll of the city. You have a lot of white shots of the city and it's just her. It's very poetic. You have her talk about the land. You have her talk about whatever, whatever the challenges were. You have a lot of exposition. There's nothing wrong with that. But I wish they would have just taken a seat, a talking head, whereby you sit her down, good lights, then you have her talk to us. Yes, you can cut to the city, you can cut to beautiful shots of the land, but you have her talk to us in a very, you know, 
one on one it's like a one on one session whereby we have an intimate session instead of the voiceover we have an intimate session with her whereby we can listen to her face to face i thought that would have been far more effective because when you actually think about it we never really get to sit down with her yeah we are following her we are following her in her office we are following her with the foundation we are following her trying to get this woman to get to get all to put together all this group of people to get them land we are following her being you know be, be, having a problem with these intelligent people we, we are just constantly follow, we are following her with her mom we are following her with her family we don't have a moment with her you know we don't have that moment and, and i believe that the voiceover part that should have just been her whereby you have nothing else it's just her talking to us describing whatever is going on in the most natural way possible uh, and i thought that was a missed opportunity because i walked out and i thought yes i can see what she's doing i know her family because they did that very well i know where she's coming from i know the challenges that they're going through but i didn't don't feel like i had a moment with her in the documentary you know i didn't get a moment where she's looking into the camera and describing what's happening in her, in the most natural way possible and i thought that was you know that was a missed opportunity so basically that's it but, but this this is a this is a fantastic documentary it's 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 really it's an eye open and as i said everyone needs to see this especially kenyans everyone every single person every person who thinks that they this should be shown in africa and europe specifically forget about americans i have nothing i have no problem with americans europeans and africans need to see this so that we don't bury some things and pretend that everything is okay you know we gave you back your freedom and we left so you govern yourself we are good because even as they left there is still a hand in colonialism i'm talking about a particular company kakuzi which is caught up in all this because kakuzi was oh my gosh there's a story there's a story about that you get to understand how many years they're supposed to man anyway as i said people need to see this documentary <laughs> everyone needs to see this documentary so basically that's it a fantastic documentary now i'll go to the next thing which is my thoughts on nbo festival in general because i'm not going to have the goods and bads i'm just going to speak because i think we kind of let ourselves down yeah 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 the festival went well during the opening and closing but we kind of let ourselves down i, I want you to think of this eh? kenya is the leading economy in east africa in terms of economies right but the biggest uh, film festival in East Africa is Zanzibar Film Festival. There is nothing wrong with that. Zanzibar Film Festival. My films have been selected in Zanzibar Film Festival. They've been screened there, and I'm grateful for actually being there. I've attended a couple of the of the, uh, of the festivals. I've been there. I've watched stuff. I've met people, and they're awesome. And they're really really good. But still, Kenya is the leading economy, and you don't have like we. <laughs> We are supposed to at least have something that is bigger than Zanzibar Film Fest. Yeah, it's competition, it's whatever you call it, but we need to have one thing like that. And, and, I, and I believe this was an opportunity to have something close to, the, to that or a step towards the right direction. Now, when I say that we failed ourselves, what do I mean? Number one, I failed myself in this because if you look this took 10 days i could have taken off for 10 days and watched all the movies and talked about each and every film throughout the festival did i do that no i did not do that because i think work is more important to me than the festival so i let the festival down i let myself down if you look at uh the investors you have a lot of investors in kenya who are ready to invest in the most ridiculous things ever in the name of oh this is so important let's invest in it but when it comes to something like film you don't feel like there are a lot of people who are ready to involve in the to, to get to invest in the culture and that also goes into the government i mean can you imagine if film was like climate change if world bank suddenly said we are going to be promote we are going to give a hundred billion shillings to african countries if they push or promote art music and film if they said that this film festival you'll see leaders in it every single day coming to take pictures on that board and beyond you see people posting kenya film commission will be the first they are saying we we love kenyan film we love film from africa we are here we've been properly involved in this process we want uh, film festivals to be a big thing if good money was involved so yeah 
investors let us down, they let themselves down. Because if when this was announced, people should have jumped in and gone like, yeah, we want to push this thing. Because I believe investment also affects every aspect of a festival because there's the marketing aspect which I'll talk about later on. The investors let the festival down, they let themselves down, they let us down, they let me down, they let everyone down. Because if this had more investment, I believe it would have been bigger than it was supposed to be. It would have been bigger than what we actually get. The other thing, uh, the film organizers, the festival organizers, these guys did a fantastic job. It's not easy, it's hard, it's difficult. It's a challenge. It's not something that is easy to actually do. Organizing a film festival is difficult. There are a lot of complexities that come with that. Um, but they did, a, they did a great job for what they have. But where they missed a point, in my opinion, is that they should have started making noise about this a long time ago. Not from a social media point of view. Uh, I understand that there are challenges that come with the marketing. I was talking about marketing, budget and stuff. And that goes back into investment. But I'm thinking podcast, I'm thinking radio. Yes, go do a podcast round, go to every single podcast that you know. Send people there to go and talk about the festival two months before it's happening. So that can be in people's head. Okay, let me tell you something about the Kenyan viewers. The Kenyan viewers want to be wooed. The Kenyan viewer, I want you to imagine of going to buy a product. If you sell a shoe, a person will come, a Kenyan, they will know they want to buy a shoe, but they will still ask, does this shoe really work? Is this the perfect shoe for me? Is this the right shoe for me? Yeah, tell me why this works. They want to be convinced. They want to be wooed. So yeah, you have to really talk to the Kenyan people. You have to really try to woo the Kenyan people. So number one, I, I, I thought that they could have done a, a, a podcast run whereby they go to all these different podcasts and talk to the people who consume podcasts because people who consume podcasts know exactly what they want and they are open to alternative media. Let me just call it that way. So I thought they should have done that, number one. Number two, they should have gone to radio. Yes, people are screaming, legacy media is dead. But let me ask you, when was the last time you entered a Matatu and they were playing a podcast? Or playing something from Apple Music? No, it's Classic FM, it's Patanisho, or it's Citizen. My Baba plays Roomba from, what is this guy called? The, the, the Citizen guy from Sunday, a legendary guy. I go there on Sunday and I find them playing Citizen. We go to an office, they're playing Capital FM. You go to an office, they're playing Classic FM. You go to an office, they're playing Nation FM. You get. So they should have done a lot of rounds on radio station two or one month before. So you hype it up, you hype up the social media so that by the time that festival is happening, it just explodes on people. They get excited and then they just come in. So I thought that was, but generally, the festival organizers did something good. The fact that it exists in itself is commendable. So now, finally, yeah, the government, the government, as I said, you guys, Kenya Film Commission, I, I checked your Instagram. At no point, I know you might have a disagreement with the organizers of this show. I know you might have your own opinions. I know maybe you are left out, maybe in the kapai, you didn't get a piece of the pie, and you felt left out and you said, no, we are not touching that. But this is a film festival that's happening in Nairobi. It's happening in the city and you're the Kenya Film Commission. You're supposed to push for it, whether you agree with it or not, because it, Kenya film, movies from Kenya, production from Kenya, short movies from Kenya, documentaries from Kenya are going to be involved. You know, you don't have to go like, stop everything, people go to the festival. No, you can just pay for an ad. You, you, you can have a paid for ad on Instagram for you know, the Nairobi Film Festival. You can post a poster for Nairobi Film Festival. You can actually get, because Kenya Film Commission, you have a blog, you can interview the organizers of the blog and ask them, what does it take to actually organize a film festival? But did you get that? No, I didn't see a post. I didn't see a personnel from the Kenya Film Commission in the festival. So that was, yes, I know you might have your differences, but the fact that Kenyan films are going to be screened there, and you, as a member from Kenya Film Commission, missed it. That says a lot about the commission and the government as a whole. You know, the government looks at film in terms of job creation. There's nothing wrong with that. But they don't think outside that. They, it's like, oh my goodness, it's like these people are so creatively bankrupt. How can you not see the opportunities that come with a film festival? Think of Cannes. 
Who knows Cannes? We all know Cannes because of Cannes Film Festival. Cannes is a, is a random town in somewhere in France that most people don't know it's even a town. They know the film festival. And if people know the town because of the film festival. You can go screen a movie in a restaurant at Cannes and come back and tell people my film was screened at Cannes. And they'll take it seriously because the word Cannes is associated with that. You have Toronto Film Festival. You know, most people have never heard Toronto. They know Toronto is in Canada. But if you are to ask them what is the next big thing about Toronto, it's a Toronto Film Festival. And you have people coming from all over the world going there to watch movies. You have people coming from all over the world going to Cannes to watch movies. In fact, a movie that is released uh, during the Cannes Film Festival, eyeballs will be there. They'll be like, yo, this was screened there. They had a seven minute ovation. This, this is what happens. Why can't we have something like that here? Why? And that can only happen if people come out to watch, investors come in, people actually embrace the culture of festivals. Whereby, now the government, how can you make this work? Because it's not just about creating jobs. If this festival was huge, can you imagine the tourist effect on that? Can you imagine a world whereby people, you have the Nairobi Film Festival happening and then you have people from all over the world, journalists coming in to just experience the film festival and then talking about the movies that are being screened there. So that when you hear of Nairobi, the first thing people talk about is, oh, the F film festival. Apart from the fact that we have a national park in the city, why can't we have one of the biggest big film festivals in Africa? What's wrong with that? Is that, not a, uh, is, is that not a tourist attraction? Or is it that the government does not look at it that way? They cannot see that picture. They don't understand what Cannes is. Why can't we make our own version whereby people actually plan why can't we have a situation where people actually plan their holiday around the idea of the Nairobi Film Festival? They know it's coming out in October and they plan their holiday around that so that they can come and experience the film festival. Why can't, why can't we have a festival whereby an international film like The Joker will come to be screened for the first time in Nairobi? Why can't we have that? Is it possible? And if it's possible, I, I, I've said it, it's clear, we all have to embrace the film culture. I don't like, I, I'm not a big fan of art films. Me, I love films in general, but I'm ready to sit down and watch anything. But I'm a big fan of film in general. Art films make me tired. Actually, these documentaries can be emotionally, you, you know, draining, but I still consume them. You get, and, and it's a different way of artists expressing themselves. And the doors, these things can open. Anyway, that's what I thought about the documentary. That's what I thought about our land, our freedom. That's what I thought about Nairobi Film Festival. I hope they'll come back. I hope they'll come back bigger. I hope more investors, I hope more people will actually look at this and try to actually embrace it. Make it, make it our own and actually just create something that can work across Africa. So basically that's it. Remember to always watch what you enjoy. If you're still here, I know it's a long video. Please subscribe. I shall see you on the next one. Adios.